In this unit, we are going to cover system D. Now, the textbook for this course uh, that I'm recording the video for is a Linux textbook that was written originally, I think, about three years ago. And at the time, in it was still probably the predominant method people were using to manage services in Linux. So most distros were still using it. And in that time, of course, that's changed, and most distros have transitioned to using System D. Um, so I think it's really important for us to learn System D. So I already covered how init works. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about it in this unit, just so you know, you know where it is, you know why why we are where we are today. But uh, but we already covered how that works. We talked about run levels, but all of that stuff goes away in a lot of these modern distros that no longer use init and instead have transitioned to System D. So let's get started, and we'll learn about. So in this unit, the topics that we're going to cover, well, really, it's only one topic. It's System D, right? We're going to talk mostly about System D. Again, all the other learning objectives in this unit have already been covered in the previous two units. I did that so that we could use the time in this unit to learn System D and do some exercises around System D. Now, to that end, in order for us to experiment with System D and use it to do some of this stuff, we are going to first learn just a little bit of Python so that we can create our own service. Um, so in my next little demonstration, I'll show you how to use Python basically to start a web server. Uh, and it, it's very, very simple. We're just going to create a very simple little web page and make sure it works. And then that we're going to wrap uh, under, with system D to make it a service. So we have two machines in this course that we're using. Uh, you can see in mine, I've got my server, which is CIS 285 CentOS, and my client, which is the one that says client. The first thing I'm going to do, just to kind of set the table here for what we're going to be working with here, I'm going to go into this machine. So I'm in my VM instances uh, in Google Cloud. I'm going to click on that instance, and it's going to show me the properties for that instance. So once that comes up, I'm going to scroll down. Uh, what I want to do is I want to add a network tag, right? But in order to do that, I have to hit edit. So what the network tag does is it gives us a, a label that we can reference this machine, right? So we can reference this in firewall rules in Google. So in order for us to experiment here, we have to open up some firewall rules in Google so we can access our machine. By default, Google blocks all access to your virtual machine in their environment with the exception of port 22 for SSH. That's why we're able to SSH, but we can't really do anything else from outside the network. Um, so in order to do this, uh, I'm just gonna give my name, uh, give my machine, I'm gonna call it CIS. 285-server. So basically it's going to recognize it as a server. I'm going to type it in and click outside the box and you'll see it gives me this little label. And you can actually give it multiple network tags. You can give it multiple names so you can reference it different ways. But once you do that, you're going to scroll down and save it. And it's going to add that network tag. So the next step is once you add the network tag, now we have to go and manage our networks to set up a firewall rule. So I'm going to click the hamburger in the upper left, the navigation menu. I'm going to scroll down. You're going to have to go down a little ways to your virtual private network, right? So we're going to go into the firewall, VPC network firewall. And when we open that firewall, we're going to be able to create a new firewall rule. This is where we're going to create a rule to add some ports. So I'm going to call this CIS285-PA3, since this is my third lab. And I'm going to come down here and... Uh, Oh, I forgot it has to be all lowercase, sorry. So PA3. So I know this is my firewall rule for practical assignment three. I'm gonna scroll down. This is an ingress rule, meaning it's for data that's coming into my machine. I'm gonna allow traffic, so I'm going to allow. Um, for the target, uh, I'm gonna say specified, uh, or all, all, all instances are fine. Um, actually, we're gonna do a target tag, right? because we want to specify that specific machine that we created the tag for. So I'm going to type CIS 285-server, uh, right? That was the uh, the tag that I created earlier. So CIS285-server should be that machine. Um, as far as the IP range, so the source IP, I'm going to just say anybody can connect to it on these ports that I'm going to configure. So 0.0.0.0 slash .0, .0, 0 means pretty much anyone, right? Uh, and then as far as the TCP ports, we're going to allow 80 and 8080. I'm going to set both. So we're going to allow both ports, both port 80 and 8080. Make sure you set up both. And that's it, right? So now we're done. We're going to hit create, and it's going to create that firewall rule. So hopefully that's going to work for us. So our next step is back on my Linux server, right? So this is my server, not the client. 
um, I'm just going to demonstrate how to create a little web server, right? Um, and again, this is just going to be in the command line at first, and then we're going to run it as a service later. So to do this, first thing I need to do, take a look at your files, right? So I am, just so you can see, I'm in my home directory, which is home student. Um, so I'm going to create a new file, and I'm going to call it index.html. So I'm going to make a little web page here. So I'm going to hit I to insert, and I'm going to put in a uh, some code that's going to be a web page. And you can do whatever you like for this. Um, you don't have to use my code. You can make your own. One thing you'll notice here is it looks like some stuff is missing, right? You can't see anything here. It's because this tries to format the syntax. If that bothers you because you can't really see anything, I'm going to hit escape and go to the command. And I'm going to type syntax off. And that's going to take off the color so you can see everything. Um, again, basically it made the color the same color as the background. Uh, so it was hard to see it. I know some students will say, oh, I can't see stuff in my files. And that's why. So once I create that, I'm going to use the uh, WQ to write and quit from VI. And now I have my little index.html. So I've got, got a web page I can serve up. Now I just need a web server. And the way you do that is uh, we use Python, right? So Python has a very simple method, dash M means method, called uh, simple HTTP server. And basically it's a simple web server, <laughs> right? I'm gonna set it to run on port 8080. Right, so just an odd port number. Um, I don't want to run anything on port 80 on here. So I'm going to run that, and it's going to sit here waiting for the you know traffic on the web. So what I'm going to do to test it is I'm going to open up my client, and I'm going to telnet to it. Um, now here's the thing. Now you'll notice here I am running as root. So I ran the su command to run as root first. You can tell from the hash sign. Uh, so I am going to install. So I'm going to run yum install telnet. And that is going to install the telnet command, which I need to test my web server. I need something that I can just create a simple socket connection and pass some commands to to make sure it works. So once I have the telnet command, I can type telnet and then the name of the machine that I want to connect to, which is CIS285 sent OS7 is its host name. And I'm going to use port 8080. And it looks like it didn't connect. So now we have to figure out why it didn't connect, right? Well, the reason it didn't connect is, if you recall, I'm going to run firewall cmd, get active zone, and it's going to tell me that it's public, right? So the problem here is we have to add the, uh, um, we have to add a zone here, right? We have to add the zone for, um, or we have to add rather a port to that zone. So first, I'm not running as root, so now I'm going to go ahead and log in as root. I think I typed the password wrong, so it might ask me to do it again. Do it one more time. I'm not very good at talking and typing at the same time. All right. Now, if you recall how we did this before, is uh, we would add a service to a zone, right? So I'm going to run firewall dash cmd, and then we're going to. Uh, set our zone to public and then we're going to add a service and we're going to use HTTP that's going to add HTTP right to our service list it works but here's the problem is the other port that I want to add 80 that's port 80 but for 8080 there is no service associated with that so how do I do that well that's going to be adding a port so here we're just going to add a specific port number we're going to set it to 8080 and we're going to tell it to use TCP for that. And it adds it, right? And we can also take a look to make sure that worked. So we'll use firewall D and we'll do uh, the zone is public. And we'll just list services. And you can see here we've got HTTP, right? And we can also do list ports. At least I think we should be able to list ports. Let's try it. There you go. So there's our ports 80, 80 uh, on TCP. And we also uh, have to make this permanent, right? Otherwise, the next time we restart firewall D, uh, it's not going to work. So I'm going to add the permanent keyword here. That way, if we restart the machine, it'll be permanent. Oops, that did not work. Oh, sorry. I have to do it for each of these commands that we ran. Um, so we're going to come in here, add the permanent keyword. So that permanently adds the port. And then we'll do the same thing with uh, 
the service. All right, so now it's uh, permanently added. All right, so now we're ready to start our Python server again. So this time, since I'm logged in as root, I'm going to go ahead and run uh, the command, but I'm not going to talk while I do this. But this time I'm going to run it on port 80 and see if that works. All right, so we're running on port 80. I'm going to come back over here to my client. I'm going to try to connect on port 80, and it's connected, right? So my next step is I'm going to do a get index.html HTTP 1.1. You have to set the host to something. It doesn't really matter what. And then just hit enter. And it worked, right? So there's my web page returned. Now let's try it from a, uh, from a web browser. So if I go back into Google Cloud and I go to my Compute Engine VM Instances, there's a little shortcut in here we can use. So there's my virtual machine. And I need the, uh, the IP address for my virtual machine, uh, the public IP. This is the internal IP. So I'm going to hide this info panel. And there's my external IP, right? And if I hit, uh, if I click on this, I can copy it, right? So now it's copied to my clipboard. I'm going to open a new frame. I'm just going to put that IP in there. And it worked, right? There's my little sample page. It's serving it out right from Python. So very simple. So now we have a very simple web server and that's the command to run it. You can see it's logging some stuff, right? It logged that I opened up the, uh, the web page here, right? So that's it. So now we've got our little Python web server. So let's move on. So what is System D? Uh, basically, according to Wikipedia, it's a software suite that provides an array of components, uh, software comp uh, system components rather for Linux. Right, it's the you know the definition in, in uh, Wikipedia. Um, that's basically what it is, right? It's a lot more than init, right? So init was uh, you know relatively simple, but also elegantly simple. I kind of liked how init worked. I think a lot of people did, um, but we're going to be looking at it as a service manager in this unit. But again, there's a lot of other things that it can do. Um, it's more than just services. So, you know where did it come from you know what is in it so you know in the before times right before we had system d when everybody was adopting system d um you know back in the old days um you know for the last 30 years we've all been using system uh, unix system 5 and bsds in it right so in it and xinid work together to manage our services in it was basically you know this is where you saw the run levels in my previous lecture right um and it was what used those run level files so the rc.d daemon so you would have all these different uh folders well i should say directories in linux right you had all these different directories um labeled zero through six and in each one of those directories you had a soft link to a uh, file that had the instructions on how to start or stop a service and that link was prefixed with an s for um, an S for start and a K for kill, right? So if you went to a certain run level, it would decide whether to start or kill. And it was all file-based, right? Um, so everything was really file-based. There was this one init daemon that ran that used the files to figure out all this stuff, right? So it was a relatively simple, elegantly simple solution, but uh, there was a lot of things that it couldn't do. So people started developing, um, you know, tools around it. One of those tools was uh, XINID, which was a TCP wrapper uh, so from a security perspective, one of the problems that folks had was that the uh, services were binding to ports directly that maybe shouldn't, uh, that didn't have, uh, you know, that weren't very, that there wasn't a lot of rigor around their development uh, and how they work. So people wanted to wrap them. And there was other reasons for efficiency and so forth. So the XINID wrapper came along. And it turned out SystemD really does both of these things all in one package, along with a whole bunch of other stuff, right? So a lot of reasons people that, uh, seem to prefer SystemD so where did it come from? Um, you know, so basically two Red Hat engineers, these two guys uh, developed it back in 2010, right? So in 2010, they started developing a replacement for it. And I think what happened was Red Hat, you know, at the time, Red Hat was the largest uh, commercial supplier of Linux, right? And they recognized the need, you know, and it was falling short for some things. And they recognized the need. And these two guys says, you know what, we're going to develop a replacement for Red Hat, right? And I think 
you know, if I had to guess, it probably originally int intended to do this for Red Hat, and it sort of, you know, because it has to work with the kernel, they didn't want to have a one-off version of the kernel, right? It changes. There's a lot of changes that have to happen in the kernel for systemd to work. So they want to have a one-off for Red Hat. So, you know, you make it something that's available to everyone. So, you know, with all these changes uh, that have to happen, it's a, and it's a, it's a huge change going from init to systemd. Uh, there was a lot of consternation about this in the Linux world. Uh, this isn't a change that just kind of happened, you know, organically, right? There was a lot of debate. There was a lot of back and forth. Uh, I kind of gave you two links here to take a look at. Um, if you're offended by bad language, please don't click on them. Um, the first one is an email from Linus Torvalds to the developers of System D, and uh, you could tell he's not very happy <laughs> about uh, the development of System D and, and how they were moving forward. Um, and that was a long time ago. It was probably around 2013, I think it was. And then uh, the other link is the developers of System D that there was so much hate for System D amongst the kind of the old guard in Linux. Um, they thought there was they felt there was a lot of myths about System D out there. So they wrote this um, you know this blog that basically was trying to debunk all the myths about System D. So by all means, uh, you know you can read that. But I you know I think it's good it's a good read the uh, blog. Uh, maybe not Linus's email, but you know you want to it's only a couple paragraphs but it gives you kind of of a sense of how much consternation there was back then um but a lot of that's kind of gone away now right um you know we've all kind of i think settled on the fact that system d is the future for linux and it's where it's where we are and it more closely emulates you know how service management log management and so forth works and device management in windows right so a lot of that infrastructure of how windows handles that you know, and Windows has been wildly successful, so they're doing something right. So I, I don't think it's a bad thing to emulate some of that. Um, but again, it, it does kind of stink to lose some of that elegant simplicity. But this is also from Wikipedia, just to give you an idea. This is all the different distros that either support or, or are not using systemd. And you can see that almost all of the recent, uh, most recent distros, all the popular ones that, you know, that you hear people talk about, you know, CentOS, what we're using, right? Systemd, Red Hat. Even all the Debian, most of the Debian distros are using it. Um, if you use Kali Linux, right, which is a, you know, good for people who are security researchers and, you know, we're not using it in this class, even though it's a security class, but Kali is, you know, also using system D, right? So uh, the only, the only popular one I could think of is Nopix. I think Nopix, yeah, it's on the list here. Nopix is not using it. It's still using the old one, although this list might be outdated. They may have switched by now. I don't know. I, I'd be willing to bet that in a few years, many of these, with the exception of things like Android, you know, I think Android needs that very lightweight um, service management that Init offers. So, you know, there's a lot of things I think are going to keep in it. We'll still see it in Internet of Things, IoT, right? Um, you know, that type of thing. But, but definitely it's here to stay. Lots of people are using it, so we got to get used to it. So it's more than just a service manager, as I said before, it's a suite of tools. And we're gonna explore some of those tools, but basically its purpose is to abstract things from us, right? Um, you know, we talked about the kernel and how that abstracts the, um, uh, the hardware and the devices from us, right? And system D is another part of that abstraction. You know, we talk a lot about abstraction. I talk about abstraction in networking, right? When we look at the OSI model, which, you know, is in my opinion, not really valid. We look at the TCP model, right? And the TCP model, uh, shows us that abstraction, those layers represent that abstraction, that if I'm developing software at the application layer, I don't have to worry about what's happening down at the data link or the physical network layer, right? I don't have to know how a switch works to develop software for a network because it's abstracted from me. Same concept here with system D is that as a system developer, as a software developer, as a system administrator, you don't really have to know kind of the ins and outs of service management in order to use it, right? You're, you can write a very simple program and it can be a daemon or a service very easily by using system D. And you'll see how we set that up. We're gonna make a very simple program that's gonna turn into a service, right? Uh, and that's something I think is uh, interesting about Linux is how easy it is to do that. Uh, it always has been within it and it it's, continues to be very easy to do that with something like system D along with all the other tools, right? So. The thing is, in it only abstracted services from us. System D abstracts, in addition to that, network resources, devices, uh, system mounts, isolated resource pools. So there's more more stuff in System D. Um, so it's uh, and and that was actually one of the complaints people had about System D is they felt that it was uh, bloatware. You know, it was just 
uh, it was suffering from scope creep. People kept jamming more features into it, right? Um, until it became really, when you think about it, the uh, the kernel and system D now are kind of what makes Linux Linux, right? It's a combination of those two now. And it was a very kind of a small part, you know, it was that first process that started. So of course it wasn't too small, but you know, it was elegantly simple as I keep saying, um, where system D, but it, it, where system D is managing a lot more, right? Before we were relying on the kernel to manage a lot of that stuff. Now kind of system D is layering on top of that. Kind of like when we look at firewall D, right? Um, Firewall D, again, it's abstracting IP tables from us, so we don't have to manage IP tables. It's kind of this tool that abstracts that from us and makes things a lot easier for us. Um, you know, and it's like flying a plane, right? People always say, you know, pilots are losing the ability to actually fly planes because of all this automation. You know, is that happening to us in the Linux world that because of all this automation and abstraction, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of losing touch with that lower level uh, as system administrators and developers and things like that. Um, that's yeah, an interesting question, right? Um, you know, in a similar way to the pilots are, you know, fewer and fewer pilots really know how to fly a plane anymore. You know, they, it's all fly by wire, right? We're kind of doing the same thing with our systems now in our, in our field. So unit files are how we manage all this stuff. So all of those things that are abstracted are represented by unit files. They're basically configuration files. Uh, using the the init syntax or INI syntax rather. So we're going to take a look at those unit files, but first I'm going to show you in the demonstration, you know, what those unit files are, where you find them, uh, and we'll we'll work on creating those later. But just to give you some familiarity with the unit files, we'll take a look at that real quick. So let's kind of explore these uh, these unit files a little bit. First, we can take a look at them, right? There's two locations. So if we list all the files in lib uh, system D system this is going to be all of your system files that were uh that were either placed there by the distribution or the package or packages the package manager things like that um so these are kind of the official installed services you probably either ran the yum command to install these or apt get if you're in debian or uh these could be ones that uh, were installed initially when you installed your your distro and that's usually how most of these get here in uh, in this file However, there's also these files under Etsy, right? So Etsy are kind of user defined. Uh, they could be specific for this machine, right? So when we create our unit file for the lab, uh, we're gonna create another Etsy, right? Um, and we're gonna tell system D to go and reload it from Etsy. So these are all kind of you know specific for this particular machine. And, and that's where we usually, in Etsy, usually we find uh, you know configurations for a specific instance or a specific machine or, you know, uh, a specific use or something like that, right? Or typically in Etsy in the uh, overall hierarchical structure of Linux. There's also commands available for us to do a lot of this stuff, right? So um, if you just type system CTL with nothing else, it's gonna just kind of give you a list of all the stuff that's happening, right? Um, you know, all the stuff that's loaded or that it's using. You can also tell it to list units. So this is gonna list, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot the S on units. It's gonna list all the units. Looks exactly the same as typing system CTL. Right. This is a list of all the units that system CTL knows about. Not very useful like that. Right. Uh, you can also use the all command, which will load all the ones that it attempted to load. So the other option we have here is uh, we can look at all of the ones that have a specific state, for example. So we'll look at all that have a state that is equal to inactive. Oh, sorry. I uh, forgot the A on all. Right. So these are all the inactive uh, unit files, right? We're not using them, right? They're not actually doing anything, uh, as an example. I, by the way, I'm hitting Q to quit every time I run these commands. We can also take a look at the ones that are just services, right? So I could say, just show where the type is a service, because we're really primarily concerned with services in this unit. So here's a list of all the unit files that define services on my machine. It's a pretty long list, right? These are all services that uh, that system D knows about that it's going to try to manage. Um, theoretically, I could just say, you know, not only show me all the services, but only show the ones um, where the state is running, right? In other words, it's an actual running service, right? Much shorter list. This is a list of all the services that are actually running on my machine right now, which is pretty useful, right? Uh, to know exactly which services that system D manages I'm actually running, right? So kind of a useful command. Um, we can also look at the unit files, right? So a little bit different. We can list unit files 
And this shows us the actual unit files and what their states are, right? So you can see whether it's static, disabled, or enabled, right? Uh, disabled means it was specifically disabled by the admin. Enabled means that it's uh, gonna it's it's enabled for a target, right? So it's gonna try to start with a with a particular target. Uh, in static, it's neither, right? Somebody could start it if they wanted to, but it's not really it's not disabled, but it's also not enabled, right? So somebody could start it. Disabled, you can't start. You have to you know you won't be able to start those unless you uh, unless you set it to static. So let's uh, take a look at. Um, um, an actual unit file, right? And by the way, when we list unit files, we can also show, you know, just ones that are enabled, right? Um, in fact, I'll show you there. So if we do uh, state equals enabled, we should see just the enabled ones, right? And we looked at that earlier in another lab. Now we can also look at the contents of these files, right? So if I uh, run system CTL um, cat, that's gonna just output the contents of a file. We'll do VSFTP, right? That's one that we set up earlier. And if you don't have VSFTP for some reason, you could do SSHD, right? That'll work as well. So there's the contents of the VSFTPD uh, service unit file. We could have looked at it, right? We could have just gone and, you know, catted the contents of that unit file, but we can also do it with system CTL. What's nice about doing it with system CTL is it shows you the current version of the file that system CTL has, right? That tells us whether or not we need to, you know, if we have an outdated version. So we might make a change in a unit file check to make sure that system CTL is seeing that change. And if it's not, we can reload the settings, right? You can see here, the type is forking. I talked about that. You can see that it's, uh, the execute start is pointing to the VSFTBD binary executable and user bin. And it's, uh, as an argument, it's passing the config file for VSFTPD. So that's how it goes and gets the config file, right? And in theory, we could go in here and modify this and use a different config file if we wanted to, right? We can also show dependencies so if we, uh, let me just get rid of cat here. So we'll do uh, list dependencies. So those are all the dependencies for VSFTPD, right? Um, so it's a nice easy way to go through and see what the dependencies are for our services, right? So that's it. So that's how we use some of these system CTL commands to look at our unit files and manage our unit files. Let's move on to the next part. So there was a bunch of stuff that was put in system D, right? There's a lot of functionality. These are all the daemons associated with system D. Um, so lots of components here. Um, in addition to system D, right? You have system D and then you have all these child uh, processes that run under system D that are associated with it. Uh, General D is probably uh, one that we're going to use in this unit. Um, this is how you do logging, right? So it's the logging mechanism uh, that's part of system D, right? Um, so it does your log rotation. It captures logs from services. It's all about logging from services though, right? Not from individual applications that you're running in the shell or in your bash uh, session. So we'll take a look at that and how to work with uh, journal, uh, journal D. And then login D is of course the login manager. You know, when you log into your machine, it's login D that's managing that, right? Uh, resolve is name resolution. Uh, time sync D is NTP, basically the NTP client. Network D is uh, handles all of your network interfaces. It's your DHCP client, right? So it's all that stuff. There's a uh, there's a daemon that handles garbage collection of temporary files or temp files that are um, you know left behind by services. Again, it it kind of relieves developers of having to do some of this uh, on their side. Um, time date D is handling time zones, right? Setting your time zone, um, you know, is things like that, setting the, the date and time. Um, UDEV D is the device manager. So that's the daemon that's managing your devices. Uh, and then system boot D or system D boot is the boot manager for in system D. So really you look at this, it's everything, right? The system D is basically managing the minutia of everything on your machine, right? Um, so this in combination with the kernel, I mean, that's, that's everything, right? Um, but it's important to know what these different daemons are and, and what they're responsible for. Uh, and I'm going to show you in the demonstration, I'll show you a little bit about journal D and uh, how we can use the journal CT, CTL command to look at our logs and manage those logs. So let's take a look at some of the options for journal uh, for journal D, some of the you know utilities we have. And this is really about logging, right? So let me start by, uh, I'm going to clear some of the junk off the screen here so we can start from scratch. Again, I'm still logged in as root. Um, so if I just run journal 
CTL. It's just going to output all the latest stuff that's happening, right? So it's just all the newest stuff. Okay. Now, if I uh, let me go ahead and clear all that junk off the screen. If I uh, type journal CTL dash B, it's uh, since the last boot, right? So this is the, all the stuff that's happening since the last time I booted the machine. That's also kind of useful. Um, but I could also just look at things that happened in uh, in a period of time, right? So for example, I can uh, look at everything that happened since, we'll say, uh, one hour ago, right? So that's everything in the last hour. I could also do one day, two days, a week, you know, whatever. There's a couple different things you could type in there, but it's an easy way to just take. You can also put specific dates. You could put ANSI formatted dates and make a date range. If you know specifically between this time and this time, I want to see what happened on my system. All right, so another option here is we can look at entries for a specific service, right? So for example, I can uh, pass dash U for a unit file, right? So specific unit file, we're gonna do VSFTPD. Oh, sorry, I have to put uh, dot service on here. And nothing's happened for VSFTPD, right? Uh, so let's go ahead and start it. So we use the system CTL command, um, and we're gonna start BSFTPD. So now hopefully it started. So now I should be able to go over to my client machine just like we did the other day. And I'm going to type FTP CIS 285 dash. Oops, sorry. I should have made my machine something easy to type. All right, so we're going to FTP to CentOS 7. I am going to log in as student, but I'm going to purposely put in the wrong password and it's going to fail. Right? So it logged in. So that should have been logged. So now, oh, sorry. Now if I look at it, so now I can see that log entry that it failed, right? So that's a serious issue. It gets logged out that somebody tried to log in and there was an authentication failure, right? What's neat about journal CTL is instead of just looking at it statically, I can pass the dash F option and it's going to show me in real time. So maybe I'm doing some troubleshooting and I want to see kind of a dashboard in real time of what's happening with that service. I'm going to come back over here. Now take a look in the background what happens, right? So I'm going to uh, quit from my FTP session. I'm going to try to log in again. Type student. Type in a bad password. And now watch. I'm going to hit enter on the password. It's going to fail. But look what happens in the live journaling. And you can see it automatically journaled out that... Uh, or logged out that somebody tried to log in a student, put the wrong password in, and then it fails in my other window. So that's just some of the stuff that we can do with journal CTL. Again, it's great for troubleshooting. It's how we're going to tell when things go wrong when we're uh, working with our services. So a little bit more on unit files, right? We're going to use unit files to manage services. Uh, there are a bunch of different types of unit files. I'm going to talk about five of them here. The, the service one is the one that we're going to use, right? We're going to create a service unit file. This is the unit file that defines a service, right? Or a daemon that runs in the background, right? Um, as a child of system D. And it's not running in a, you know, a logged in user space. Um, so we'll see how to do that. So it has instructions on how to start and stop services, basically, and where to find a service uh, binary and so forth, and some of the other options that we'll talk about. Socket is a unit file for uh, defining a network socket. What's interesting about System D is, um, and Exxon D kind of did this, is you can create a socket that whenever connections are made to a socket, it launches a process to do something, right? That's a little different than a service because a service is always running, right? Whereas with a socket, you can, you can trigger... Um, yeah, this is one of the things you could do with socket is you can trigger a process to run to do something with that with that data. So, for example, if you set up an FTP server, sometimes it doesn't make sense to have it running in the background all the time because it's rarely used. Um, so you could use something that triggers it, you know, when on, on demand. Right. It can also make uh, make it a little bit more secure. Right. Uh, so a variety of reasons you would do that. And then device, uh, that's, of course, for mounting uh, devices using system D. So your devices have a unit file. Uh, again, a little bit different than how things were done prior to when we had system D and then you have your mount, um, uh, your mount unit files, kind of like FS tab, right? Uh, if you learned about that in the previous course, you should have learned a little bit about FS tab. Um, the system D really kind of handles that here and then, uh, targets. So targets are kind of like a collection of stuff and, and think about runtime, right? Or run levels. 
And we talked about run levels, you know, run level zero was stopping your machine, run level six was rebooting, and then you had a bunch of run levels that were in between. Um, the targets are kind of like run levels, right? It's if your target is multi-user, right? Normal multi-user mode, then that target defines, you know, all the different services and all the different unit files that have to get initialized at that target. Um, so you can have different targets, right? A target for reboot, a target for shutting down, a target for normal no mode, target for not networking, single user mode, and so forth, just like we did with our run levels. Um, so again, it's a little bit different, but the concept is the same, but how we configure it is a little bit different. Um, I would say, just, I think, you know, for a lot of folks at first, it seems kind of confusing because in, in it, you had just this very simple structure of directories and you knew whatever was in zero was all the stuff that was going to get stopped. You knew it was ever in one was all the stuff starting and stopping when you transition to the, the state of one, right? Um, but here, when we transition between states, there, you have to, you, these unit files are kind of connected to the target, right? So you, you reference a target from your unit file to say, I want this service started with that target. And when system D initializes all your unit files, it, it sorts all that out. It kind of makes this map of, you know, of, of how all this works together and what has to be started and what has to be stopped as it transitions to different states when a user initiates that. So, um, so that's basically what targets are. You're going to see when we create a unit file, we are going to set a target. Uh, you know, we're going to make sure it's in the right target so that if somebody enables the service, meaning I always want it to start, uh, you know, when the system starts up in order for that to work, you have to have a target set that's valid. So it knows which state system state to automatically start it up when it's enabled. So when you do that system CTL enable, which we did with VSFTP, how did it know which state in order to start it with? That's how it worked, right? All right, so that's a little bit about unit files. Um, basically, unit files contain sections. Uh, those sections have key value pairs. It's uh, very much like an INI file. It's the INI syntax. So you have a key equals a value, right? And that's it. Uh, and the sections have uh, curly, or not curly brace, I'm sorry, square brick brackets around them, which you're going to see in the example. Um, they typically have, so a service typically has at least three sections, which we're going to look at when we create our service file. You'll have the unit section, that's the first section of the file. And the first thing we usually do is uh, provide a description. It can be anything you want. You just, you know, you just make something up, whatever you want, however you want to describe this service, you know, what does it basically do? And then you have after means uh, what is the dependencies of this uh, for this service? In other words, what this is saying is this particular service we're defining cannot be started unless network uh, everything in the network target is running, right? So we're referencing a target here because network, there's a lot of stuff for networking, right? There's a lot of daemons and a lot of processes and devices that all have to be online for networking and they're all defined in the network target. So the network target basically goes and does all the stuff for networking. Well, if that target is not successfully, you know, initialized, then we don't want this program to run if it needs the network, right? So what we're saying here is that the network is a dependency of this, uh, you know, uh, or uh, we are dependent upon the network. I'm sorry, I worded that backwards. So we are dependent, this particular service is dependent on the network running and being initialized before we can do anything, okay? Um, and you can list other targets there, right? Uh, that you feel that are necessary for your service. Um, and then you have the service block, right? So this is the section for the service. Uh, the type I put here, simple, that's the most common. It's, you know, typically what services are, but there are other ones. Um, if working, for example, is if you have a service that starts, but it spawns other processes that create other child process IDs, uh, system D needs to know that, that that's going to happen, right? And you do that by using the forking uh, type. So, uh, so simple is just one process that runs. Forking is where you have lots of other processes that get spawned. And sometimes the initial process that uh, system D starts actually is going out and starting other processes and when it's done it shuts down and now we have maybe three or four other processes or one other process running and again system d needs to know that it doesn't want to interpret the closing of the initial uh you know as a as a crash and try to restart it when it's really these other ones that are running that's important right um so forking again if it works that way you have to set it up that way vsftp for example which we installed already in this course uh, is uh, the type is forking, right? Because it forks other processes and has uh, children that run under it. Uh, one shot is when the process that gets launched is going to run, it's going to do something, it's going to close, and it's supposed to close, right? 
So system D needs to know that, that, okay, this is a process that I'm going to start that I should expect it to close down when it's done. Uh, and I don't need to restart it. You know, I don't need to worry about it, but we can also control the restart in other ways. Notify is a little different too. So, um, you know, some services that are complicated, you know, like MySQL, right? MySQL is a database engine that's, uh, you know, it, it does a lot of these things I talked about, right? Um, but MySQL also doesn't start right away. It goes through kind of a series of startup steps. And, you know, if you set it to notify, then the system D is going to wait for all those messages to come back for the service to say, okay, I've successfully started, right? And then move on. So it's, uh, it's going to make sure that the service is actually started and it's going to take those notifications that come back and show them to the user when they issue that start command to say, hey, the start failed and here's why, or the start succeeded and here's the information about it, right? Um, so that's notify. Um, you have to tell it what user it's going to run under. So in my example here, I have student, right? I have a student user on my machine. So my service is going to run under that context of a student. And I also have to tell it what its working directory is, right? So in other words, not only the context of the user account that the service is running, but what is the location from whence it is ran, right? Uh, so here I'm saying it's running from home student, right? Just the home directory of the student user. Um, that way it has, it has a place to start from, right? It has a relative path. Uh, so this way, uh, you know, if you have paths inside your, you know, in your program, they can be relative instead of, you know, hard, you know, hard paths, you know, the, the full uh, path to things. And then you have exec start. Exec start is typically going to be the full path to a binary. Um, the binary being, you know, an executable program. So this is the instruction that says, when somebody types system CTL space start space, whatever the service name is, this is where it's going to go to figure out, okay, what exactly am I starting? What program, what application, what process am I starting? What binary am I running? Uh, and that's where it's done. And you can also have switches on here, right? You can have arguments, um, you know, various things. It'll just, it's just going to run whatever's in there. Just as if you typed it at the command prompt as the user that you defined in the location that you described here, right? So it's almost like, when you look at this service section, it's almost like I'm logged in with that user. I'm in the directory that's defined and I'm going to type out those commands under execute start. And that's basically what it does. And likewise, when somebody tells the service to stop, you can tell it to run a series of commands. Now, the way this works is if you don't provide exec stop, if you don't put anything there, it's going to stand, it send the standard, you know, we, we played around with the kill command, right? The kill command is a way to send a signal to a process to stop, right? Um, and there's different signals that you could send. Well, one of those signals is a normal stop, right? I just, I, you know, when you're done, I'd like you to close down, right? Um, and that's basically what, what system D will do. It's going to send that signal, but you could also override it here with exec stop and tell it to send other signals if you want, or you can have it run other programs first before it sends the, uh, the kill signal, right? Um, so you can do a variety of things here. So if the, if this, if the shutting down of your service is more complicated than just stopping it, right, this is where you would define that. We don't need to in our example because it's going to be relatively simple. So restart is, uh, you know, if the service somehow stops, the process it's managing stops, it needs to know what to do. Should it be restarting it? Uh, should it do nothing, right? And there's different types of failures, right? You could have, you could tell system D to always restart no matter how it stops. And by the way, when I say it stops, this is a stop event, you know, an event that, that is a process stops outside of the control of system D. So in other words, system D is sitting there and all of a sudden one of the processes that it's managing or that, that it started goes away. It says, oh, this process stopped, but I didn't stop it. I need to go do something, right? And if the reason it stopped is anything always will always restart it no matter how it stopped or why it stopped on success means it'll restart it even if somebody killed it on purpose right so i went in there and sent the standard kill message to stop the process uh, then system d is going to just restart it for me right automatically um, on failure we'll just restart it on failure right um, on success is unusual why would you want to stop it if it's if it was you know a, a normal um, a normal stop that somebody initiated right unless you've got you know some reason you know high availability or something that you know you need to make sure it's running all the time um on abort's a pretty common one right on abort means that the service crashed right it, maybe there was a fatal exception or an unhandled exception that caused the uh, the process to crash, um, that's when it will do a restart, right? To say, okay, something bad happened, let's restart this, right? That's pretty common. I think most of us would want that for our services. 
All right, so just a quick, uh, oh, and finally install. This is uh, where you define what targets should be launching your uh, process that you're creating here, right? So in here, we're saying multi-user. So whenever somebody uh, starts the machine in multi-user mode, uh, we're saying that this is something we want to run in multi-user. That's our intended target. Um, and you could have multiple targets if you wanted, but the, um, uh, this is this is very similar to putting it into one of your run levels, right? Making sure it starts with a certain run level using the check config command, for example, which we sort of saw previously. Now, a quick word about uh, about sockets, right? So we're not going to use socket for our example because what we're going to do is we're going to have our service bind to a socket on its own uh, instead of using systemd. So instead of systemd binding to a socket and spawning our our application. Um, and I talked earlier about how socket, there's actually unit files for sockets, but you can also, when you create a service, you could have a socket section that says start on port 80 and you're going to, and that's the socket and you're going to bind this process to that socket, right? On its behalf. We're not going to do that here, but that's something that's pretty common. Um, and you'll see that in other unit files. If you look at them, some of them define the socket in system D, which one is better, um, you know, there's a lot of documentation around that. And there's probably a lot of debate about which one is better. Uh, for example, Apache does not use the socket options in uh, in System D, uh, but there are other services that do, right? So, um, you know, and Apache is probably the most common web server on the planet, right? And they don't they don't use it for a variety of reasons that they that they defend, right? Um, so there's lots of ways to look at this. But I, again, I'm not going to show you socket here, but I, I encourage you to go take a look at some of those options so you're aware of them. And you'll see them in some of the other init files when we look at that. And if you're looking for those options and a better explanation on some of those, um, this is, of course, your textbook doesn't really have a lot of this in it. Um, so you could go, uh, there's a URL here at the bottom of the presentation. You can go take a look or just Google around and you'll find it. There's lots of resources. The documentation for Red Hat and Debian have resources about this. Uh, and there's lots of tutorials and things like that. So we already saw that we can run uh, Python as a web server, right? Um, so using a simple command. So we're going to turn that into a service. So it runs automatically in the background. Now, of course, you could just run in the background with the ampersand on the end, right? And manage like a process. But that means it has to run in your user space. Uh, you have to be logged in, right? So we don't want to do that. We want it to just run in the background, right? It's a kind of a poor man's web server. So should be relatively straightforward. The first thing we need to do is create that file. Now, if you recall, when we make our own unit files, we want to do so in the Etsy systemd system directory. And you're going to call it whatever you want to call the service. So I'm going to call this easyweb.service, right? Dot .service, meaning that it's a service, right? Now I'm going to uh, add some lines to my file. Uh, so first, we know we want to, uh, give me one second just because I have a hard time typing and talking at the same time, I'm just going to paste it in, <laughs> right? So uh, I, the description for mine, I just called it Brian's Super Simple Web Service. Uh, the, um, I made it uh, dependent on the uh, network target, right? So networking has to be running. It's a simple service. The user I'm going to run it under is student. Uh, the directory it's going to, from which it's going to run is student. Um, and it's just going to run simple HTTP server on port 80, right? Same exact command that I ran in the command line. I'm just going to put it right here in exec start and see if it works. Restart on abort and, of course, uh, multi-user target. So if we enable it, it'll run under, uh, under the uh, multi-user target. That's it. So let's go ahead and save that. So our next step is to try to uh, start that service. But before we do that, uh, we, get, we need to reload our uh, system CTL. So what this is telling, what we're going to do here by running the uh, daemon reload command is it's going to go through all those files and rebuild its understanding of all the services. So it should pick up that file that we just created automatically. And now if I cat, if I use system CTL to look at the contents of easyweb.service, it should show me, right? And there it is. So it knows about that service. So I should be able to try to start that service. So if I come in here, just change cat to start. It tries to start and something bad happens, right? It says uh, unit is not loaded properly. Uh, check your system logs, et cetera, et cetera, right? So I made a mistake in the file. I'm going to tell you what I did. So the thing about system CTL is you can't just pass the command. 
it has to have the path to the executable for that start. So you have to put the full path in. So I'm going to put the full path, which in this case is uh, USR bin, right? So in the USR bin directory, that's where the Python executable is. So let's go ahead and save that. And I'm going to try to start my service again. Now it says it started, right? But let's take a look and see if it uh, actually is started. So you can see here it failed, right? It didn't actually start. So let's see if we can figure out why it didn't start. Well, I can kind of tell already, right? It went into a failed state, but um, we can use journal CTL to kind of see the full log of why this failed. So let me just scroll up here till I get to a journal CTL command so I don't have to retype it. And we're gonna change this to uh, easy web. I don't want the minus F option because I'm, I'm not real time on it. I know it failed, right? So if we look through this log, what we would be able to figure out eventually uh, through a little trial and error is you would figure out that um, we are trying to run that service on port 80 and we're doing it as a student user. And just to show you if I'm, so I'm backed out now to as a regular user. And if I type the command to run Python at port 80, it's gonna tell me permission denied as a student. I can only do it as student on port 8080, right? So let's go back in. Now I'm back in as a uh, root because I can't modify these files without being root. So I'm going to edit this file and just so the service is going to work because I'm using my student user, um, we are going to change to port 8080, right? Which the uh, kernel should let us start the service on port 8080 because it's not a low port number. Let's see if that works. So now we're going to try to start our web service. Uh, it's telling me that it uh, it thinks that I possibly changed my file, right? And in fact, if I use the cat command, let's take a look, right? So the cat command uh, shows the right value, but we need to reload the daemon. So let's see if we can find that command in here to reload. Do our daemon reload. Then we're going to do our start. It looks like it tried to start. And if we check the status... It looks like it's running now. So if I open up my web browser and I'm going to change this IP address. So I'm gonna put HTTP, actually just to kind of prove this works, right? We're gonna do, uh, put in google.com, right? So we're on a standard web page. I'm gonna paste in the address, but I have to put a colon at the end, port 8080. And it worked on port 8080, right? So my web server is working. And if you're not able to use a web browser, you can do the same thing here from the client. You're just gonna use the telnet command, change your port to 8080, right? So telnet to your host name on port 8080. Type get, because we're getting a web page. It's gonna be index.html, HTTP version 1.1, host is whatever and you get the page back and it worked. Now what we could do, just as one final little example here, is I'm going to add, um, or I'm going to uh, use the journal CTL command and show some real time messaging here. So if I go back to my client and try to load a web page, you'll be able to see these messages happening kind of in real time that somebody's trying to load a web page, right? So get HTML, HTTP, 1.1. Now take a look in the background behind this command I'm running and you should see that uh, it shows that somebody tried to load the web page and it shows that it came from my client, right? Which is 0.3. So it works. And that's it. So we we're able to create a service. We we're able to run it, right? And uh, everything worked. So uh, that's it. That's the lab. Thanks for watching. And if you have any questions about any of the material in this unit, please let me know. Thank you.